Well, good morning and welcome to Ideas That Can Change Your Life. I'll start my timer because I'm trying to keep our talks down to 20 minutes. It's a good discipline for me. Um, and uh, so when I hear the chime, that'll be when we have to close things up. But anyway, so this morning I was stimulated by a, a meme on my own Facebook, which um, juxtaposed a quote by Lincoln and by Lee. And Lincoln said, uh, if I, uh, basically he said that uh, uh, if I could keep the union, I wouldn't free the slaves. In other words, the union was more valuable than slavery, being slaves being free or not, you see. The union was the primary concern. And then Lee is juxt juxtaposed with that, who said that uh, with the uh, war is uh, all the war is com war, w the horror of war is coming, and if I could buy up all the slaves, I'd free them. If I could prevent this war, so the meme kind of like suggested that uh, Lee was more concerned about slavery than uh, uh, than than uh, Lincoln. So Lee was more virtuous than Lincoln. So I looked at that and said, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why is the Civil War continuing? Why, <laughs> why, why is the Civil War still morphing and recreating itself in America as a division between two virtues? See, the people in the South feel that the South has more virtue than the North, and this gets uh, disseminated in our political talk, how liberals are, or conservatives are uh, more valuable, their view is more valuable than liberal view. It gets really exaggerated into extreme uh, uh, myth uh, images and, and ideas, you know, even the liberals are the antichrist, you know, and whatever like that. You see how crazy it gets. But it goes back to this original division. And so I look into this. What is this original division? That these two quotes, Lee and Lincoln, kind of like uh, 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 conceptualize, at least for me. So we want to look into that. Um, so I put up here, is the South more virtuous than the North? Well, what, what, first of all, virtue is something the Greek philosophers used to uh, try to discuss and figure out what is virtue. Well, virtue, and we don't really use that word much in our society because we don't, we don't really know what it means. We usually say, I'm virtuous, or my people are virtuous, so this is virtuous. Um, but it's truth. It's being in alignment with the absolute. It's being in alignment with God. It's being in a, virtue is being in alignment with God or being in alignment with nature or being in alignment with life. So virtue, virtue seems to be uh, uh, a truth or an alignment that is real. So the unvirtuous would be not real or out of alignment or wacko or whatever you want to call it, you see, beyond the pale, you see. So we continually divide reality up into these two categories, with me, of course, being on the virtuous side, and the other guy being on the not virtuous side, you see, outside the real. But let's look at these two, basically. So I had Lee versus Lincoln. Now Lee's concern, and it's my opinion, that the South, the virtue of the South, has been towards the individual. The virtue of the South leans towards the value of individuals, individual freedom, which is a virtue, uh, individual meaning, uh, individual value. And the North, liberals, seem to lend towards the whole, the virtue of the, the needs of the whole, the whole society. 
So you've got this contradiction between the needs of the individual and the needs of the whole. And you kind of like see it in this Lee versus Lincoln comment here where Lincoln's concern was not with the right or wrongness of slavery, but with the preservation of the union, the whole. You see, America is a, the American experiment, the American ideal, the American Constitution, the Declaration of Independence creates a new whole. Okay? A new world. That's what we were the new world. A new world. A whole. It's integrated. Of course, it was flawed because of slavery. And they couldn't get a union and handle slavery, so. They just put slavery on, the, they just bypassed it and created 13 colonies and created an integrated whole, a new world. And so the Constitution was designed so that you could constantly bring into this whole immigrants so America becomes a refuge and an expanding universe, an expanding whole. So when the Civil War erupted, that slavery issue could not be accommodated with the whole. So the American egg was going to crack up. And that would be the end of America. That would be the end of the dream and the end of this amazing experiment, which is not only economical, but also spiritual. This is a spiritual idea of creating a new world that includes all, through inclusion, through expansion. The Big Bang, so the universe is expanding. The universe is not excluding, well, no, we're not going to have that galaxy. Well, get that cosmos out of here. No, it, it includes all, it expands all, you see. So America was conceived as an and of course our geography fit into this because we had so much room to expand in. Well, go west, expand, you see. Dropping a rock in a pond and the ripple just has no boundaries. But this rock of slavery, you see, broke it up. And so Lincoln's concern was with restoring the Union and slavery was incidental to that. But Lee's point of view was the value of the individual. And of course, individuals uh, in the South were white individuals because black individuals didn't have the same rights as white individuals. But anyway, the point is that there is the virtue in the South leads, lends towards politically, what I see, towards the value of and the importance of the individual against the importance of the union or what the uh, right calls the government. <laughs> so you see, the government, you see, is the government is a subset of the union. So when politicians say the government is the enemy, metaphorically they're saying the union is the enemy, the whole is the enemy, because it's preventing the individuals from having their rights. The government is trying to take away my rights, my individual rights, you see. And that seems to be the refrain that runs through our history is that the government is going to take away my, my individual rights, which this gets back to these two quotes where there's an emphasis on the individual and the rights of the individual juxtaposed or put against the force of the rights of the whole or the society as a whole which ends up into regulations and no regulations, you see. Individuals take the shackles off, take the regulations off. Government says regulate in order to prevent damage to the whole. The system won't work unless you have laws. The, the whole won't work unless you have some kind of regulation that governs the behavior of all the parts. If you take off all the regulations, you have chaos, you have anarchy, everybody's just going blah, 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 all over the place, you see. <laughs> so there's this constant play between union and individual freedom and order versus chaos. 
And order will always come in to prevent chaos. So the 60s was a renewal of the Civil War, but on a psychological basis. So you had a division in virtue in the 60s. And the division of virtue in the 60s was in patriotism. Patriotism was divided in the 60s. I was there. And the Vietnam was the trigger. So, in the Union view, your country, if your country says we're going to war, you go to war. Just like in World War I. World War I united the Union. Everybody went to war. Everybody. Here in Blackstone. Everybody was at war. They had air raid wardens in case the Germans flew a bomber over Blackstone, even though they didn't have an aircraft carrier. So this idea was that, uh, uh, but Vietnam, instead of uniting the country, divided the country because it split patriotism. The individual awoke and says, hell, I'm not going to war. That is a immoral war. So I'm not going to do its patriot. It's patriotism to refuse to go to an immoral war. It's patriotic to obey my individual consciousness. And the other half said, no, it's patriotic to obey your nation. That's patriotism. Defend your nation, nation, your duty. So duty was divided. Duty to the, my individual conscience or duty to the uh, conscience of the whole, which says, uh, you're drafted, buddy, you're going to war. See, in World War II, people volunteered for the war. If they got drafted, they were happy to serve. Notice uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, so this division of patriotism began in the 60s in many different ways, and it's still continuing. The division of virtue. So we have today, we have liberal virtue and conservative virtue. And so we've lost the single idea. See, so with this, we have to, we have to, uh, America has to recreate itself as it's done in its history. If America cannot recreate itself as a new whole, as a new world that's unified, America will fail into a hopeless civil war of self-destruction. So this split, and now we, have, now we have a division between news. So Trump says, my news is virtuous and the media news is not virtuous. Mine is true, theirs is not true. This creates a neurosis. This creates a, uh, an American schizophrenia. Got two worlds. Which one am I going to be on? You see, they both look true to me. I can't choose. So there's constant confusion, constant turmoil, constant disorder. The split in virtue cannot be sustained because you don't know what's true. There's nothing to align yourself with. The parts have to align with the whole. Even a hurricane knows that. The eye of the hurricane is a single idea that unites all the energies around it. See, boom, boom, boom. The hub of a wheel won't turn unless there is a center, a single idea. The single idea of America has to be born again. The single idea of America cannot be restored because previous single ideas won't work in today's world because the world has changed. The waters have changed. Today's hurricane did not grow on last year's warm water. Today's hurricane grows on today's warm water. So the single idea that restores virtue and patriotism in America must be born. And we don't know what it is because it hasn't been born again. We, we are basically the unborn. We're like two twins in a womb trying to fight on to see who's going to be born. 
<laughs> Neither one can be born because they're both equal. They're Siamese twins. They're connected. I'm going to be born. No, I'm going to be born. No, I'm going to be born. Blah, blah, blah. They don't get born. But the tension grows. Man, this baby's got to get born. You see, So this new idea has to get born. So the greater the tension between the two competing virtues and the impossibility of one of them removing the other. You see, you can't, when you're in this dynamic here, the part can't remove the whole and the whole can't remove the heart because they're the same. The whole can't exist without the parts and the part can't resist, exist without the whole. And yet we have the illusion that if you remove the government, all the parts would be free. Or the government or the whole says, well, if we don't value, we, we can, uh, we, the whole cannot value, the, the, the value of the individuals is not necessary. Now, I don't have to listen to them. You see? So this, this uh, contest, this, this uh, civil war is basically mad. <laughs> it's basically insane. The Siamese quint twins cannot eliminate their brother, so one of them is the idea that unites America. Now the Republicans have pressed this to its logical conclusion. They finally got all the branches of government, Congress, President, Supreme Court, Senate, the whole works, and, it, and, and has failed to unite the country. That's the last shot. Can't go any further than that. They can't get any more power. Yet, it consists. So, obviously, the conservatives cannot unite the country by eliminating the liberals. The conservatives and their values of the individual cannot, cannot unite America and restore America as the one by eliminating the whole, or the liberal view. That's why the Republicans can't make the government work. Because their primary value is that the government can't work. <laughs> so that's like becoming, believing that a steam engine can't work and now you're the engineer. And you're supposed to drive the chain, train, but I believe it won't work. But I'm hired to run the train, what do I do? So they don't believe the government can work, and yet they're hired to run it. So all they can do is prove that it can't work by not making it work. See, I was right. Government doesn't work. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> See? So we're in a time of madness. But the tension will grow to the point that we're going to create a new America not give birth to an old America, not restore America, but create a new America that has never existed before. And we don't know what it is, and that's what's scary. Having a baby is scary because you don't know what it's going to be. What kind of a life is this? This baby's going to take on its own life. It's going to be whatever it wants to be. I don't know what it's going to be. I can. Parents try to control it. No, you're going to be an engineer. You're not going to be a guitar player. You're going to get a job. They can't control it. So we're, we've got to create America that we can't control. And we only want to control something is to make it look like the past. Our old values, you see. But the new America is going to have a synthesis of new values. A new America is going to be a synthesis. You see... Uh, Hegel, I'll end with this, I remember my philosophy days, and Hegel had a single idea that was called the dialectic, and it was the logic of change. And he said that you have a thesis, thesis, and then you have, and out of the thesis, which would be a one, its opposite is created, which is anti-thesis. And so now you have a thesis and its opposite, an antithesis, and now this becomes a synthesis. These two create a synthesis that transcends the opposites 
and creates a synthesis, which is a new whole. And this is the logic of life. You got the mother, you got the father, you got the baby. A new world. And so America was this baby. It was a synthesis of the opposites of Europe. And so there's my bell, and we shall stop there, and I'll see you this evening at uh, Martini time.